Uh, these forums aim at exploring big questions, and we certainly picked an ambitious one for today. Is beauty a guide to truth? Uh, it's a very difficult puzzle because there's something to be said about both answers, yes and no. Um, on the one hand, it seems like beauty couldn't be a guide to truth just because it seems so di different from truth. Uh, beauty seems, you know, we think of it as subjective, varying from person to person, maybe culture to culture. There are different standards of beauty. Truth feels kind of objective, out, out there and mind independent in ways that beauty just feels like a bad match. On the other hand, you have this situation where plenty of scientists describe themselves as being explicitly guided by considerations of aesthetics and beauty, whether they call it elegance or simplicity or parsimony. And so you have this puzzle even within the sciences, let alone the fact that perhaps scientific truth is a small portion of truth. So we couldn't ask for two better people to help us think through these puzzles than Art and Ben, who've uh, each spent decades thinking through aspects of these issues. And we're really glad to have them here. The plan for today is going to start with Ard, where he'll present a kind of opening, walk us through how he thinks about these issues. And then we'll turn it over to Ben to also give us an extended kind of presentation and how uh, they think. And then they're going to actually talk to each other for a little bit um, and let them kind of, uh, we have no idea where that'll go. They don't know either. Uh, we'll let them kind of explore some of this territory together. And then we'll open it up to you. And Ard, I'll turn it over to you. So take us away. Um, this very famous quote from the, uh, the romantic poet, John Keats, who um, wrote, beauty is truth, truth is beauty. All, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. And um, this idea that beauty and truth are linked together is very old, it goes back to the ancients. And you'll find it again and again um, spread throughout um, the, the scientific world as well. Interestingly, the Keats is also famous for another quote on this topic where he, in another poem, Lamia says, cold philosophy will conquer all mysteries, empty the haunted air and numb the mind and unweave the rainbow as is earth well made. And my colleague Richard Dawkins wrote a very famous book called Unweaving the Rainbow. I, I don't, I think Richard Dawkins is a great popularizer of science. I don't always agree with him on philosophical matters, um, but what, on this particular issue, I do agree with him which is the, the feeling of odd wonder that science can give us is one of the highest experiences of which the human psyche is capable. And very often those feelings of odd wonder, awe, um, the sense of the sublime, the sense of beauty, these things are linked with one another. I've got a friend at Rice University, Elaine Howard Eklund, who's one of the, the leading um, sociologists of, um, sociologist of uh, science and religion. And she was telling me that in one of her big surveys she did of how scientists think about religion, she noticed that as she asked these kind of big questions, scientists kept moving back to aesthetic considerations. So the idea that they love their science because of the beauty, and that they had these kind of experiences of the sublime, these experiences of awe when they discover something new. And that beauty could vary a lot, and I'll talk a little bit about how that beauty varies, but this sense of, the, of beauty was very, very, common. And so she's now started a project looking at beauty in particular. What, what's kind of fascinating about this is that also the, the motivation for beauty correlates very much with the kind of seniority and how well people are doing in their field. So scientists who consider themselves to be technicians and scientists who were saying they were thinking about leaving the field were very unlike, were much less likely to have this experience of beauty. So whether or not their scientists are fooling themselves or not, sociologically, these kinds of considerations have played a very important role. That's what Dawkins was trying to uh, unravel and explain in his book, Unweaving the Rainbow. So I'm gonna give you one example of beauty. This is one of my great heroes, Paul Dirac, uh, physicist at Cambridge, the other place, but I'll still, can still be my hero. And uh, in the 1920s, he was thinking about the following question. So you probably know that special relativity, Einstein's theory of high speed, was worked out in 1905. That's a, that's a theory about things that move very fast. And in the 1920s, Erwin Schrodinger came up with Schrodinger's equation, which is a theory of very small things. And so what Europe was thinking about is what happens if you take something that's very small, you try to make it transform according to the equations of special relativity, the Lorentz transformations. And so you know, in, in special relativity, you also have concepts like E is mc squared. When it moves, you get this extra p here. So you get some momentum terms. 
But the question was, could you get this energy equation for the Schrodinger equation to transform in the correct way according to the theories of false things? Now, here you have two very different aspects of the world, fast things and very small things. And when you put them together, it turns out, in this case, Dirac looked at electrons, which have spin up and spin down, so they've got two components. No matter how you try to put them together, the only way that you can make it work is if you have this extra particle, this thing which we now call the positron. And very famously, Dirac published this equation, although the idea of some kind of other matter out there was insane. And he later said he published it because it was beautiful, and beauty is a guide to the truth. Now, in 1932, Carl Anderson discovered uh, the positron at Caltech. And so this thing was discovered after it was predicted by this incredible beauty of mathematics. Now, I remember as a student first taking a course in advanced quantum mechanics and learning this, this um, derivation by Dirac and thinking, well, that can't possibly be true. How could two such distinct theories, when they combine, predict something so incredibly crazy about our natural world? And I actually spent the whole night trying to see where Dirac was wrong. And of course, that's the, that's the hubris of youth. Uh, and of course, I bowed to the great master because this is the only way of doing it. And so this kind of idea that you can use elegant mathematics to predict something about the, the, about something really unexpected about the world is a kind of something very beautiful. The Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner talks about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, a gift which we neither understand nor deserve. And I think it's incredibly beautiful. I think the Dirac equation is one of the most beautiful things that has ever been created. As beautiful as the most amazing painting, the most amazing piece of music, as beautiful, in fact, as the most amazing mountain range. It's absolutely exquisitely and incredibly beautiful. And Dirac was very strongly influenced by aesthetic considerations when he went down this direction. So this is the idea of matter and antimatter. So the idea of matter and antimatter comes from uh, these two, these two theories and combine them together. And it's an absolutely beautiful part of the way the world works. It's very elegant, very, very satisfying to see. Those are all aspects of, I think, that we have of when we describe something that is beautiful. I have a quote from Henri Poincaré, one of the great French mathematical physicists, who said, a scientist does not study nature because it is useful. He studies it because he delights in it. And he delights in it because it is beautiful. If it were, nature were not beautiful, it would not be worth knowing. And if nature were not worth knowing, life would not be worth living. I put this at the end of my lecture sometimes because I want to inspire, inspire my students that science is incredibly beautiful. And the sense of beauty, the sense of aesthetic that we have when we, when we work on it is one of the great drivers of our discoveries. Now, beauty is complex. And so the kind of beauty you see here in quantum mechanics may not be the same as the kind of beauty you see in other parts of nature. So currently, I'm very interested in biological complexity. So let me give you an example of that. So here is a, uh, here is a picture of the genetic regulation of an E. coli bacterium. Each of the little dots is a gene, and each arrow is a regulator that tells the other genes to turn off or turn on. One of the things that creates biological, biological complexity is not just the number of genes you have, but also how they, they regulate each other or how they interact, a bit like the logic of a transistor chip. And if I write these down as sensitive equations, it looks a little bit like this, which is not particularly beautiful or elegant. Nevertheless, I believe as a physicist that there is some kind of beautiful underlying picture to this, which is much simpler and more elegant than these equations that I've written down. When Elaine Howard Eklund and her collaborator, Brandon Vaidanarayan, um, interviewed people on this, what they noticed was that the kind of beauty that inspired scientists varied a lot from field to field, from biologists who might look at beautiful things to see in nature to physicists who like elegant equations. But the idea that beauty was very much present and very inspirational for them was more or less a universal. All right, science can nevertheless be used to unweave rainbows. And I'll give you one little example, which I think is, which I'm going to use to explain something about how Christians might think about beauty. So let's think about the question of equality of human value. I hope that all the people in the audience would agree that humans have equal value. But how would you measure that? Is there some kind of empirical measure that you can use to, uh, to get at that? So can science help you? Well, how would you measure the value of a human life? I think I can give some facetious examples like 
by a chemist, the value of elements in your body. So if you have gold fillings, you're worth more than somebody without gold fillings. Or if the physiologist decides your brain, psychologist, how smart you are, and anthropologist, how the community values you, and the economist, how much economic value you produce. But I think we all sense instinctively that if we use these kind of scientific measures to try to calculate the value of human life, we're unweaving something incredibly important because we sense that human beings have intrinsic value. It turns out that actually deriving the intrinsic value of human beings from a purely kind of um, naturalistic point of view puts you on a kind of metaphysical quicksand. And it's easy to kind of take a Nietzschean turn and then say, well, therefore this idea is, is invalid and perhaps even dangerous. Christians would normally um, make this kind of a, an argument based on the fact that we are all made and loved by God. It's been linked to what we call the doctrine of creation, the idea that God created a world and he created human beings and loves them and that there are value comes from that. Now that is, I think, a much more promising way of trying to extract something about the, uh, the value of human beings. I'm just contrasting that to show you that science cannot often extract these kinds of things about the world, although you might be able to use science to help you sharpen some of the questions that you want to answer. And I want to use that because I want to talk about beauty in a slightly different way. I'm going to be slightly, take a daring step and talk about um, feminine beauty. So here I've got a picture of some models on a catwalk. And one of the fascinating things about this is that the, each of these people looks remarkably similar to each other. There's a very narrow aesthetic value. And even when you diversify it in quotes, and you add people of color, for example, you'll notice that they actually look the same as everybody else, except they're just slightly tweaked. Now, compare that to the kinds of people you'd have in the audience, or for example, someone like myself who grew up in Africa and then lived, uh, traveled around Asia, now live in the, in the UK. The way that people look varies dramatically. The kind of local aesthetics that people have for what they consider to be beautiful can vary dramatically. So why is it that we have such an incredibly narrow view of beauty in the fashion industry. And I would say it's because our ideas of beauty are twisted. And I want to end with this quote from C.S. Lewis, a great Oxford writer, who has a lovely book on, called The Screwtape Letters, where these two devils are writing to each other about how they want to tempt somebody. And Screwtape writes to um, Wormwood, God is a hedonist at heart. He makes no secret of it, of his right hand or pleasures forevermore. His world is full of pleasures. There are things for humans to do all day long without his minding in the least, sleeping, washing, eating, drinking, making love, playing, or praying, working. Everything has to be twisted before it's of any use to us. We fight under cruel disadvantages. Nothing is naturally on our side. And so Christians would say that beauty, one of the dangers of beauty is that it's so easily twisted. And the example I just gave you of feminine beauty ideals in the Western uh, kind of fashion industry, where they all look very similar to a particular type of Northern European woman. There's something deeply and fundamentally twisted about that beauty image. And so one of the things I think about beauty and truth is that beauty can, can be deceptive. Beauty, I think in order to truly understand the link between beauty and truth, we also have to understand something about the wide diversity of beauties that are there. And I think this links very closely, um, for Christians at least, to the idea of a doctrine of creation for a, a, a world that was made with incredible diversity. And therefore, we should expect beauty to have an incredible diversity as well. With that, I want to thank you for your time and hand over to Ben. Thank you very much for including me in this conversation. Um, let me offer a sort of a, a different framing uh, of our question. So when I was a much younger man, I prospected for dinosaurs in the badlands of Southern Alberta. I clearly remember walking the rim of a deep canyon with two team members when we happened upon a rock. This rock was smooth and had been dropped by a glacier. It was about the size and shape of the wheel of a small car. None of us had to speak to the others. We immediately stopped walking and two of us crouched down and hoisted that rock up onto its edge. It was about 200, 300 pounds. And we flipped it, thump. And it kept flipping down the side of the hill, thump, 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 gaining speed. Eventually, it finds its natural axis of rotation, and now it is spinning like the wheel. And that rock leapt, it dove, it skittered, it gouged like a living thing. It's running down this topography. We can't see from the top of the, of the canyon. 
And like a living thing, at the bottom of the canyon, it darts into a, a scrubby patch of bushes and trees with a crash. And for a moment, there's a pause. We all thought the show was over. We had just started to turn when that rock came out the other side of the grove and started climbing up the other side of the canyon. When finally it collides with the block of sandstone and annihilates it in a cloud of dust. That event, a rock rolling down a hill, was one of the most beautiful things I, and I think my companions, had ever seen. At the very least, it has clearly stuck with me for all of these years. As a young student of physics, I had a similarly formative experience of beauty involving wheels. I recall the first time I grasped how the simple and austere principle of conservation of energy dictates the speed at which an idealized wheel rolling down an idealized canyon must be going when it reaches the bottom. In the case of my wheel, by the way, it was about 80 miles per hour, in case you're curious. That gave me a similar thrill of having glimpsed the beautiful. Now I share these two recollections to illustrate at least two faces of beauty. Art has already pointed out that beauty is complex. And I wanna to point to two very different aspects. One, I'm gonna call the beauty of uh, experience or beauty in the experience. This is beauty that emanates directly from our participation in the world, like watching that rock careen down the canyon. The other is beauty in the apprehension. This is beauty in the apprehending or grasping a representation or story about the world. This is the sense of, of understanding, the aha moment of getting how conservation of energy gives me that speed. These two aspects or sources of beauty take on radically different significance depending on which of two views of the world you happen to hold. One of these views I'm gonna call platonic. In this view, all the phenomena of our day-to-day -day existence, you know, what we experience at the, at the scale of medium-sized dry goods, uh, emanates from a few principles, perfect and regular in their operation. What we might call laws of nature, say. Everything we experience in the moment is some shadow of these principles imperfectly presented to us. Right? This includes the beauty of the experience. From this platonic view, the greatest possible experience of beauty is apprehending those original principles. In, in the world of fine arts, uh, Michelangelo, an avowed Neoplatonist, uh, is a good representative of this attitude. Think of uh, what he says of the statue of David being revealed in the stone, not crafted. Right? Uh, that, that statue, the figure that we get, is a reflection of, and is meant to be a reflection of, some ideal form that can't be realized in the experience. The beauty lies in the ideal human form that statue reflects. The other view of the world we might call Aristotelian in honor of Plato's contrarian student. In this view, the nitty gritty phenomena we access in our experience, the phenomena that display infinite detail of pattern and variation are the substrate of the world. And any principle we use to summarize or describe those phenomena are themselves but poor shadows of the happenings, of the experiences. The beauty of experience is a gift of the world in this view, while the beauty of apprehension is a byproduct of the stories we tell. We seek to organize uh, or to find pattern, right, to help us conceptualize this beauty of experience. Artistically, I think uh, Via Selmans represents this attitude well. She's a Latvian American uh, artist famous for her drawings of desert pebbles and ocean surfaces. Drawings that repl replicate in extraordinary richness all the details we tend to abstract away when we imagine such a thing, when we remember such a thing, rather than stand in its presence. So what does beauty then have to do with truth? Again, it depends on which of these views of the world you adopt. For the Aristotelian, the central question is, what is true of this beauty? 
The beauty of experience provokes us to try and organize it into tractable patterns, but there's no necessary connection between the beauty and apprehension of any of these patterns we might nominate and they're actually being true of those things in the world. For the Platonist, the central question is which beauty is true? If we assume that there are these laws or principles that determine the phenomena, and furthermore, that these laws are comprehensible, are apprehendable by beings like us, then there is a close connection between truth and the beauty of apprehension, the beauty of that aha moment. That which we find beautiful to apprehend is a good candidate for the true principle that generates the world. Now, what do I think about this connection? I, you might have guessed. Yes, by this point, I'm an Aristotelian. And from that view, you know, recall that the beauty of apprehension is about our descriptions of the world, stories we tell. There are many beautiful lies, and I am suspicious of beauty as a guide to any sort of truth. But even if the Platonist is right about those underlying principles, I still don't see any reason to take that, that extra premise. I don't see any reason why those principles, those laws should be comprehensible to us. And I suppose I would point out that as, as Art already mentioned, there's, there's variation from discipline to discipline uh, with respect to scientists' sense of beauty. But I would suggest that the sense of beauty scientists individually cultivate is even more idiosyncratic than that. Uh, and that what it is likely indicative of is the history of recent scientific successes that which we created, that which gave us a, a moment of, of beauty of apprehension um, uh, uh, sticks with us, right? That, that's what we seek in the future. It's not a guide, right? As much as it's, a, it's a, a summary of the history of our success, it's not a guide to the creation of future success. Uh, and I, I think now we, we get to it. Thanks. Let's yeah. try these ideas. Uh, so we got uh, both of these uh, kind of views laid out on the table. Art, do you want to kick us off and I'll let you two have the floor for a little bit? Yeah, no, that's that's helpful. So I'm just um, trying to think of the Dirac experience and asking myself whether this is Aristotelian or Platonic. And I don't think, I think Dirac was a bit of a plate to this, but I don't think that's what he is getting at or what subsequent physicists are getting at. I think what they're getting at is if you have a number of different, what you, what you often have is you've got a, a phenomenon you're trying to explain, you've got multiple explanations that seem consistent. Um, and so what, what this strand of physics has shown is very often picking something that's, that is relatively simple or elegant or has a certain kind of beauty to it uh, has turned out to be correct. Whereas there might have been other more complex descriptions that haven't always been correct. Now, this is not the case that this always works. Um, but it works often enough that people are very struck by it. And so I think in, a, in theoretical physics, for example, this idea that um, beauty and elegance, something is often hard to explain, but people recognize it. And so you can, one point is that can write on something, say this is a beautiful derivation or beautiful equation. People will by and large say, yes, they recognize it, even if it's not, not so easy to put into words what we exactly see. And I don't think that, so there's a, I don't think that we need to make this distinction quite between having to believe that there is some kind of deeper beauty out there that is, that we're going towards or that it's, there's a beauty in the apprehension. I think these things are linked. So if, if you finished your thought, there's, there's lots of things I'd like to say to that, but I'll try to st stick with two and see if this takes us down an interesting path. So. The small thing has to do with the Dirac example itself. Um, it's not obvious to me that's the best choice of, of beauty guiding us in the sense that um, in that particular example, and we can let this go by the wayside, but it looks to me as though what Dirac is doing is an example of, of constrained search. It's not that he had uh, a sort of palette of possibilities and selected from amongst them the most beautiful, rather he had two let's say empirically well-motivated constraints, you have a sort of a symmetry constraint and a, and a conservation constraint, and that imposed on him this, this um, um, you know, supposition of the, of the positron. Um, but we could, of course, put on the table other examples where, where I don't know, uh, Gelman's omega minus, where the, the claim at least was that the way at which it was arrived at, and again, 
I'm a little skeptical of this, was, was by selecting uh, uh, from amongst the options in those few. So let me ask you, um, with respect to, to, to sort of uh, uh, a shared sense of beauty in the community as a guide, I take it, so if we, if we don't want to commit to this sort of mm, platonic supposition that the world will be such we can apprehend it uh, and that the principles are really sort of simple out there, we just, we just need to identify them by their hallmark of, of beauty. If we don't want to take those suppositions, then one way this sort of link is, is often defended is something like um, a meta induction. This we we've we've come in our in our arduous journey to to being professional scientists. We've we've seen what works, and that gives us a sense of beauty. Now this happens all the time, right? Like I've soldered thousands of solder joints. I I actually have an opinion as to what constitutes a beautiful solder joint. I didn't before. I do now, and it has a lot to do with with one that will work. And I take it the idea is something like this is true of science. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it goes beyond that. So I think there, there may well be something beautiful in solder joints that work well. And then what you find beautiful is the fact that it works well. And but probably the fact that it works well is also linked to some aesthetic considerations of what the joint looks like. Um, it's not you know, irregular, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's interesting in of itself that that's true. I think in the case of the science, it's, it's not just that we are somehow enculturated into this and therefore now we believe this is beautiful. We work hard now, we think it's beautiful. I think you can't have an experience like watching special relativity and quantum mechanics combine to make antimatter without thinking there's something deeply beautiful about it. I think Dirac's point about the beauty was not that he had a constrained search, that's what he ended up with. It was that he ended up with something so crazy it seemed absurd. And then he just said, look, it's such a beautiful, elegant equation. It must be true. And therefore he published it anyway. And that's the, the sense of beauty that there was, right? So the sense of beauty was, this is so beautiful, it must be true. And therefore he published it. And then, it, you know, it, it, was, it seemed fantastical or, or just bizarre and maybe some kind of mathematical weirdness and possibly wrong, but it ended up being true about the world. And that's the sense of beauty that there is. So he would, using beauty as a, between multiple ways of trying to make this work, a way that, um, that made that actually added an extra um, kind of ansatz about the world that seems ridiculous um, because he felt that that was the more aesthetically beautiful one to do. Now, of course, that has that that experience has has sociologically infected the community for good or for ill, and so that uh, you know we'd all like to to, to do something like Iraq again, and there have been steps that were, where things of similar nature have happened and. Uh, um, in our film, Why Are We Here, that I made with David Malone, we did a long interview um, with Frank Wilczek, a very reasonable prize winning physicist who has written a very beautiful book, a very nice book on, on beauty. And he talks about discovering the strong force. And uh, if you look on the, I think somewhere they've, li they've linked the, um, our interviews that we made, but he talks about this discovery, and it's, it's which he made amazingly when he was I think, 22 or 23 years old, which is a pretty amazing age to discover how one of the four forces of nature works. But he said, you know, there are lots of different ways of thinking about it. And we, we, you know, beauty was a very important guide into the one that we chose and the one that actually ended up working, the one that gave something called asymptotic freedom. And so the experience of, and, and, and Wilczek has done this many times again in his, in his work. And so the genius of like Wilczek, of course, is that he knows when to use this and when not to, when to start and when to stop. That's why he's a Nobel Prize winner and others of us are not. Um, but, um, but it's fascinating to see how that continues on. That's the Durakian um, uh, tradition. And of course, we're influenced by that, right? So our hero is Wilczek and Gilman and um, Durak, we like to do that again. So now I've moved now into looking at biological systems. These are much more complex and much, um, much the, the, they're much less amenable to this kind of approach. And biologists, in fact, are often very suspicious of this kind of approach. They're suspicious much more generally of, of kind of inductive reasoning of this type. And um, I think for good reason, but I nevertheless think as a physicist that there are aspects of a biological world that are going to be a lot simpler, a lot more Dirachian once we understand them properly. And so I think the reason, I think there's good kind of um, pragmatic reasons to be suspicious of inductive arguments. And that's because these negative arguments have to be constrained by data. And I think data often isn't good enough. 
So I feel I work on evolution, evolutionary theory, which is often um, uh, presented in, in ways that I think are aesthetically not very attractive. I think it's one of the reasons for a lot of lay opposition to evolutionary theory. And one of my kind of goals in life is to try to make it more a more beautiful theory, a more aesthetically pleasing theory, which I think it can be if you understand it properly. And I think in so doing, it'll also make it more palatable for many people who find it difficult. So, okay, I'm going to jump in here because we're actually at time to start letting our audience ask some questions and we have some already on the table. So I'll just throw this out to both of you because I think it applies to both of you. Uh, a question from anonymous uh, viewer asking, I think your views on, do you think beauty, beauty is intrinsically a trait or is it something that only exists from a secondary point of view? Or is it something that exists because we label or create something as beautiful? Um, uh, each of you hinted at uh, aspects of your answer. It'd be nice to just flesh those out a little bit. I'll let Ben answer that since he's a philosopher. Um. Uh, sure. Um, so in, in my view, it's a little bit of both. Um, I, I suspect or I, I think that there are aspects of beauty, particularly, well, actually both of the sorts I described, beauty in the experience and beauty in apprehension that are uh, uh, inescapable and almost certainly um, consequences of being the, the kind of thing that can respond adaptively to a world. So uh, you, you make a thing with a, with a mind that, that gives it, or at least the minimal sort of mind that gives it the ability to respond to an environment and, might, and for a variety of reasons, I think that such a thing must uh, have something along, uh, uh, along the lines of the experience of beauty, just like it has something like pain uh, and, and positive affect or, or pleasure. Um, but beauty is also highly malleable and in that sense can be constructed. I mean, uh, Ard pointed to the, to the folks on the catwalk and, and to cultural variations in ideals of beauty. Um, but, you know, there's also, as I was trying to suggest with the, the mention of soldering, there's, there's a sort of sense of beauty that comes with habituation and familiarity. I mean, there's a very robust psychological effect the more you you're you're um, exposed to a thing the the uh, insofar as you're not harmed the the greater your sense of affection regardless of of any other effects of the thing and um you know the 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 sense that that derives from our repeated toil in a particular area is, is usually a very compelling uh, um, uh, emotion or experience of beauty so i think it's a little of both art no, I think that's, that's, and that's a good answer. I think that it's a, it's a bit of both. And I think um, there is sometimes a, a, a tendency to say because there are cultural variations in how we, we see certain beautiful things, therefore there's, there's nothing but that. I don't think that's necessarily true. Although, you know, it's defining beauty perfectly is, is a famous philosophical black hole. And many philosophers have fallen down, never to come back up again. On the other hand, it's a little bit like um, uh, there's a very famous judge. I forget what the name of I forget the name of the judge. You might remember this man, but um, he was asked uh, how he could um, distinguish, you know, art from pornography. And he said, I, you know, I can't give you definition, but I, I know it when I see it. And um, I think this with beauty is the same thing. We, you know, we 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 do know it when we see it very often, even if we can't necessarily always give it a, a complete. A fixed definition. And that's why I, I wanted to emphasize that beauty is a, it's a complex thing. Um, but one of the things that you see in the experience of scientists in beauty is also, you know, you get the sense of, of awe or a sense of the sublime. One of the things we noticed when we made our film, we interviewed a lot of scientists and asked them questions about beauty, asked them how did they feel when they made discoveries. And um, this is why we started talking about the sublime, which often even brings a kind of sense of terror, a sense of fear, like you've touched something that you really know, something very beautiful. The kind of thing you see when you walk around a corner up a cliff up a up a cliff and suddenly you see this incredible mountain vista you sense a sense of something larger than yourself and i think beauty does that to us it centers us it makes us feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves and i don't think that is just a kind of a psychological adaptation i think that is i think that is a kind of um something about our world as a theist obviously as a christian i believe that's something that god has made put into the world as signs of transcendence that tell us something about the way the world is. I mean, the world could very well not have this. The world could not have elegance. The world could not have intelligibility. Those are all surprising things about the world. Um, and on theism, I think they're more likely. 
And so I, I look at it, that's my own, you know, my own kind of lens that I look at the world with. And I think that, um, I think that is an important part of how I think about that. And I think, well, beauty is part of that. Even if I recognize it as heavily culturally and, you know, historically um, colored. We have a couple of questions that I think are for Ard. Uh, do physicists all really agree that Dirac's equation is really beautiful? Is there any disagreement about it? They have different tastes about it? And a follow-up, I'll combine this with another one. If so, even if they did agree, could this be just because you're, you're trained in graduate school, you're socialized in a certain way. I'm pretty sure most of us lay people, when we saw your uh, slide with Dirac's equation, we didn't, we didn't think, wow, that's beautiful. We were like, what does that mean we squinted our eyes? And so we have to be trained, like you'd have to like habituate us, as Ben said, into this sort of thing. And I, th these questions might be pushing at, you know, maybe there's this other explanation uh, for beauty be beyond yes. God made the world with beautiful. I mean, do physicists disagree? I think physicists will disagree on everything, but that is a, it's a pretty vast majority view. And no, I, I think just obviously we are, um, we are socialized into thinking of, about certain things, but in certain ways. But I think that many physicists experience of the Dirac equation is one of surprise, of awe and of beauty in a way that's um, is not just because we were trained to think about it that way. So even if nobody told me it, it is beautiful, I might go back and say it is beautiful. That's a very common experience. And so that experience is a very commonly shared one. Even in fact, in fact, I'd say one of the problems with physics education is that it doesn't emphasize nearly enough the sense of beauty, the sense of awe. It's often ignored in education. It becomes a kind of rote um, um, doing lots of problem sets. But that beauty is something that, that you see on the side. And in fact, often it's linked to understanding. So just like you may, um, you know, if you're not trained in music, you may not appreciate something about a very subtle piece of music. You may not just appreciate Bach's fugues, for example, if you, all you've listened to your whole life is uh, a country music, uh, as an example. Nothing wrong with country music, but you're not gonna appreciate the fugues in the same way. But if you're trained classically, you will, and that's, that's just normal. That's the way our world is, right? There are certain types of beauty that you need some training in order to understand what is beautiful about them. Can, can I make a, a quick comment there? Um, I, two, two things about the, the agreement in the sense of beauty. Um, you know, we certainly don't have time to try to do some kind of some kind of proper sampling, but there are cases like, for example, the vortex theory of atomic structure, where where the community at large hailed this as a as so beautiful it must be true and nobody remembers it anymore. Um, uh, so one wonders a little bit about uh, um, some, some confirmation bias uh, in, in what sets the, the sense of beauty. But I guess I also want to point briefly to, to uh, pretty large divisions in science. Uh, there's a, 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 a pretty nice article uh, recently in Nature, a perspective by Ben MacArthur on the, the differences in the sense of beauty between the physical and the biological sciences. Uh, and they line up kind of interestingly with the, the Platonic and Aristotelian perspectives that, that I had sketched. So, so maybe it's not quite so uniform across the sciences and, and maybe not quite so, um, maybe unanimity isn't, isn't, uh, isn't such a guide uh, to truth within a given discipline. So uh, we have a question coming in about whether beauty is objective or subjective, which is a classic kind of part of the discussion literature on beauty and philosophy. Um, if it's just subjective, the question goes on, is it then a different category kind of beauty? I'm guessing they're talking about this sort of mathematical or you know, the sort of beauty that guides fundamental physics. Um, and it sounds like, just to clarify for the audience, it sounds like in the background, are, are you thinking of beauty as like, look, it varies quite a bit, and yet there's this core unity, which has which cries out for explanation. And then Ben, are you thinking, of, no, 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 even if there's unity, we have other explanations for it, and uh, we need not appeal to anything like a transcendent kind of objective beauty. That Help help us as lay people understand where you're each coming from. So uh, Ard, why don't you start out since uh, we just heard from I think, I think you summarized it well, so I'll hand over to Ben. Um, okay, yeah, I, I would want to draw a distinction. So I don't I think Art and I actually disagree to, to a large extent. I think there is an, an objective phenomenon of beauty in the sense that it is an essential part of, of one's experience of the world. It's like, it's like color, it's like pain, uh, there, there's no avoiding it. But what I am critical of is not, what I'm not saying is that the sense of beauty is, is somehow subjective or, or purely constructed. What I'm concerned about is the connection between that experience 
And this other thing, which is rather abstract, which is this, these claims that we make about the nature of the world based on uh, some sense of, of beauty we get from apprehending that story, that explanation. So I'm critical of the connection between what I take to be a real phenomenon of beauty uh, and this other thing, this, this, this understanding of how the world is. I think we, where, we, where we also agree is that we both agree that science can be extraordinarily beautiful. Um, and we both give examples of that. And I think we don't think necessarily that those conceptions of beauty are purely subjective in the sense that I think that anybody else, you know, so one of the interesting things about the beauty in physics, one of the things that's um, in the sociological study is that these ideas of what was beautiful were widely shared um, across different cultures, which might have many other, uh, other aspects of beauty, like say um, uh, um, human beauty that might vary quite a lot. And so the idea would be this is quite, quite similar. There's an interesting study by one of the people we do in the film as well, Samir Zaki, who's a, neuro, uh, um, a neuroscientist in, in London, who together with Sir Michael Atiyah, a famous mathematician, did a study with a brain scanner of having mathematicians look at equations and rank them in beauty. And there's a part of your brain that lights up when you see something beautiful. And so what they notice is these mathematicians from a wide range of different cultural backgrounds, all more or less you know, agreed on which equations were, were most beautiful. And, um, and so the point is, is simply that, you know, um, there's a correlate between the same, so if you put those same people in front of a beautiful painting or a beautiful landscape, the same bit of their brain would light up. So the point was, is there, the bit of their brain that was lighting up when they saw these mathematical equations was the same as, as their experience of beauty in other contexts. And um, so whatever this neural correlate is, it correlates with the experience of beauty. And what is fascinating is how much um, this is shared across cultures. It's more complex because um, one of the points is, is that some of the equations people like, just, they like to just because they look beautiful. So very famous, the Euler's equation, e to the mm. i pi is, is minus one. Um, is uh, uh, it's beautiful, it's also pretty to look at, right? There are other equations, like I wrote Dirac's equation in one way, you can write it in many different ways. Some ways are more beautiful than others. In fact, when we interviewed Sir Roger Penrose um, here in Oxford, who just won the Nobel Prize actually last year. We interviewed him, he's very much a Platonist and a, um, a big believer in beauty. He would, I was talking to him about the Dirac equation, I started putting it on the board and he insisted I wanted to, to do it in a slightly different way, which is more beautiful using spinners. Um, and that's just, that's just an aesthetic, um, point. You can actually write the equation in many different ways. Um, but the, when people talk about the beauty, they're not talking about how you write it. They're talking about what it actually means. Yeah. And, and actually, that sort of gets to what I was saying. So that neuro, neurobiological study you're, you're speaking of, some of the, many of the participants in that study didn't know what the equations meant. They had, they had no way to uh, interpret. So to them, it's this experience of a visual object. And there we're talking about this sort of what I was calling this beauty of experience. And we know that people like things that are somewhere on the edge of, of chaos, right? En enough order, but enough disorder uh, uh, to, to, to spark our, our, our sense of, of beauty there. But you know, the question is, does that have anything to do with what the things actually represent uh, are true? You know, what they say about the world are so. Uh, and I, I guess I would say broadly that, look, I think sometimes uh, uh, in the short run, certain of those rules do line up with, with what's necessarily an, an inductively apt procedure, but just as often they don't. Hmm. And uh, maybe it's a good time to segue into, uh, we talked about this, the, the three of us a little bit before, where if we raise this, the scope of truth to be beyond just empirical sciences, beyond natural sciences, and there were some surprising points of agreement be between you and some, some further disagreement, um, why don't you each kind of go by, uh, say how you just sketch out how you think of that. So, R, do you want to begin? Really, ben, I'm going to understand your question. Oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, you mentioned some stuff about human value. How do you value humans? And th these are questions beyond merely empirical natural sciences. So this is a question is, can beauty be a guide to empirical truth? And then there, can beauty be a guide to truth simpliciter? So like, there's more the, to truth than just the, what the empirical sciences say, which is you kind of su suggested. Um, well, I mean, this is a, a much longer conversation. And I think uh, I'm, I'm also a little bit more heads in the tread in that direction since I am a scientist and not a, a philosopher or a sociologist. But um, I, I do think that beauty, at least well, beauty is a very important 
part of our world. I think it has a lot to do with human flourishing. So I think, um, so I, know, I think beautiful architecture is important, not just because we think it's pretty to look at, because I think it leads to human flourishing in certain ways if it's done well. I mean, Elaine Scariot, um, who's a, um, a professor of English at Harvard, has a really interesting set of ideas, of books, a book actually, about um, beauty and justice, where she links the two. Um, and this is because beauty, I think what beauty does to us is it, it creates a sense of transcendence, it creates a sense of centering to us, it also creates um, a sense of motivation. And so I think those are kinds of directions I might go very briefly on this question. So I think, yes, there are links to truth there, um, but they're more, they are, I think, interestingly, I think they are harder, um, they're sometimes harder to, um, to pin down than I think the senses of beauty and, and the sciences, which are, which are pretty strongly felt. Okay, and Ben, so yeah, you, you've, you've been pushing against the idea that beauty can be a reliable guide in the natural sciences. How does your answer change if we were to just expand to truth in general? Well, uh, that, that's an awfully large bucket uh, <laughs> of things to think about. Um, but so I would say from, from a sort of platonic perspective, I might not be so worried about it. It's not really a, a different question in kind if what I'm trying to do is sort of you know, ascertain the, 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 the right simple principle because I'll know it when I see it because I will think that, that beauty and apprehension is telling me about, about this truth. But from my perspective, from this sort of Aristotelian perspective, it's even worse once we leave the empirical sciences. In the empirical sciences, you can cultivate a sense of beauty that, that is a sort of meta-induction on, on uh, theory construction, on, on you know, ways to attempt to, to grasp a certain sort of pattern. And, and just to unpack that for the audience, so a, a meta-induction, like an induction on an induction, you, you want to just say in, in simple terms, what do you mean by this? Yeah, so you, you've, you've built laws that do pretty well with a wide range of, of stuff over and over again. Uh, and every time you get some new phenomena, you build a new law and you start to recognize patterns in this. Just like if you're doing something like soldering, you do it over and over again, you start to recognize uh, patterns in what makes it good. And you come to see those as beautiful. And so the thought is that in a scientific context, or this is one of the arguments for connection between truth and beauty in science is that, you know, look, we get to do this over and over again. And we see that, hey, when we appeal to, to symmetry, that gets us a theory that, that does the job. And so more and more we see symmetry as beautiful as, as just, you know, the, when we apprehend a theory with symmetry, we, we see it as beautiful. But when you step outside of, of that context where you don't have this feedback from the world over and over again, then I, I worry there's, from an Aristotelian perspective, there's just, there's nothing to guide your, your, your tuning of, of your sense of beauty in, in this case. There's, you know, that sense is malleable, particularly when we're talking about apprehension. And if I don't already know the truth, it, it's pretty hard for me to develop the, the, the sense that, that connects the two. Mm. All right, thanks. And we have a, a, a follow-up question kind of uh, from someone asking about Sabine Hassenfeld, I believe. Um, some people claim that beauty is currently leading physics astray. And it mentions Hassenfeld in parentheses. What do you think about this? And this might be Chris for your mill, Ben, but Ard, why don't you start? Yeah, no, so, so um, uh, I'm quite familiar with that literature. I think she has a, so the, the point that she's giving out a little bit is to say, this using beauty as a guide has been very subtle now. At the moment, um, it, what she's really saying is, I think is the, is the following. We've tried for a long time to combine quantum mechanics. So, the, so really the, the standard model, the theory of, um, of the strong force and the, and the weak force um, with gravity and um, the extra, extra weak force, so the, the magnetism with gravity, and we've not succeeded. Gravity, we have this general theory of, of relativity. It's completely different from these quantized pictures of the world. And a lot of the, what's happened is people have used mathematical ideas and used beauty as a guide. So string theory is a classic example. People, my colleagues who work on string theory will say, it's so beautiful, it has to be true. It's a very, very common. That has guided the field for the last 30 years. And her argument is, well, perhaps we should take a step back and not use this kind of Dirachian way and try something different because it hasn't worked. 
And I think that's fair, right? Um, I think that's a fair argument. She's not saying that beauty hasn't worked extremely well. She pointed that it hasn't worked well. She's just saying, given the failure we have had so far, um, perhaps we should jettison that. There's another aspect to her argument, um, which uh, um, people like George Ellis have pushed on, which is that when you're theorizing without experimental constraint, and you keep doing this for a long time, at some point you're moving into something that's more like philosophy than traditional science. And if that is the case, then you might wanna think about this as a kind of philosophy of cosmology rather than just science per se. And therefore you might wanna adjust some of the way that you do uh, make your claims or how you might do your, your arguments. And I think um, that's just because the, uh, you know, there's some in the news today, I saw that they, people in Fermilab think they might've found a fifth force, but we're still very far from seeing anything that would help us um, constrain these theories. And so um, that case as uh, Ellis and others, we ought to be more careful about the kind of claims that we make. And, and it, it, if I understand you right, Art, never did you say something like, it's so beautiful, it has to be true. Like beauty is this, this, like subjective experience of beauty are necessarily a guide. It sounds like you're saying they often are, and it's it's haunting and mysterious and a deep puzzle. Why is that? Is that fair? No, that's that's a nice way of summarizing. Yes, they often are, and physicists will say that, and this has played an incredibly important role in in physics, in modern physics. And so, what what um, is being critiqued here is the idea that we've done this for a long time, and perhaps we should allow a few other voices at the table. And I think, and I'm all for diversity in in scientific approaches, and I think. Um, that would be a good thing to do. But I mean, the point is that is that this idea of beauty, um, so beautiful must be true, is such a strongly felt in physics, and this is, has you know pushed a field on for a very long time. And, and then and these, these ideas are extremely beautiful. And right. you can't avoid beauty isn't like the equations look beautiful. Beauty is there is something incredibly elegant about how some of these things work together. There's correspondences between the theories and different limits that somehow link together in ways that seem. You know, so beautiful that they must tell us something about the way the world is. Mm. And, and just to clarify, Ben, so we don't have the wrong impression, it doesn't sound like you're saying scientists should revise their practice of science by appealing to beauty here and there when they, like, in the side, try to justify a, a choice of a hypothesis. Am I right in saying that? Like, you're, you're okay with that. You're just thinking, reflecting on what, what's going on behind that. Is that right? I'm... Um... I suppose I'd say I prefer in terms of methodology if people were significantly more direct. So there is uh, in the sense that there, there are some, some clear and hard headed ways to, to, to look at the development of, of uh, inductive development of a theory of going from your observation to, to, to the next construct. This is you know, where I would point people is, is to what's called formal learning theory. Now, um, is that, you know, there, there are two things at play here. One is sort of the logic of the problem. If this is what we want to explain, uh, what, what would get us there? What would reliably get us there insofar as anything does? What's the strongest guarantee we can have? How do we go there? Um, and I am saying that I don't think the sense of beauty is that. Um, uh, I, I think that it, you know, I think what uh, um, Dr. Hassenfelder's book uh, shows about the current state of physics is maybe that it, it really is a, a sort of, um, you know, this attachment to, or, or use of beauty is an appeal to, to recent past successes and is not itself a, a productive uh, method for guaranteeing us forward progress. But um, what as a psychological fact human beings are able to do, right? So it, a lot turns on what we expect our theories to be. If our theory is to be something that can be apprehended by one person, uh, then we are severely sort of limited in which of this uh, pieces of this logical space we can explore. So when you ask me if I'm, if I'm trying to tell a scientist to change their practice, um, the answer is it depends on, on what you're willing to understand a theory of physics to be. If it, if it is to be the traditional sort of thing where we can write down a simple analytic expression, uh, something in, in a mathematical form that's closed and say, ah, this is how the world works. Uh, if that's the constraint, then we probably are permanently hobbled by our, our, our various limitations, in which case, you know, various appeals to beauty are okay, but let's not mistake them for, for guarantees. If we take a, a, a broader view of what a theory can be, uh, which actually sort of allows into the discussion things that are, are beyond an individual apprehension, 
then then it's a totally different question. Then it's then it's a question of of sort of what we can achieve collectively or piecemeal, and that's a that's a much longer conversation.